A warm welcome to all of the uh, distinguished participants who have joined us yet again for the fourth and last week of our virtual academic program at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies on enhancing security and justice to co coordination to counter transnational organized crime. I'm Dr. Catherine Lena Kelly, the Associate Professor of Justice and Rule of Law here at the Africa Center and the faculty lead for the program. And I am pleased to be the moderator for our fourth and final plenary session here today, which will be about making coordination to counter transnational organized crime inclusive of citizens and communities. On the virtual dais with me today for this panel, we have Dr. Martha Mutisi, Senior Program Officer at the International Development Research Center, and Mr. Rauf Farah, Senior Analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Let me go over just a couple of summary takeaways from last week before we jump into this week's content. Last week, we thought about what kinds of benefits and challenges that there are for security and justice actors who are engaging in different forms of cross-border coordination to counter transnational organized crime. And we heard from several different distinguished speakers, Dr. Tariq Sharif, the executive director of Afropol, Dr. Mutoy Mubiala, an associate professor of law at the University of Kinshasa and a former specialist at the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. And we heard from Commander Abebe Molune, the director of EGAD Security Sector Program. From those three panelists, we heard about the different roles that continental, regional, interregional, and bilateral coordination can all play in cross-border efforts to counter transnational organized crime. On the continental level, as you heard, Afropol is pushing its agenda forward. There are 55 nationalized offices linking up different countries that will engage in police cooperation through the organization. They're developing a police communication system, trying to connect these different national offices. They have their first confidential operation currently underway. Um, and they are linked up to the regional police chiefs cooperation organizations trying to ensure that there are synergies that are being exploited there in relation to Afropol as a whole. Based on their 2019 work plan, which Dr. Sharif talked to us about a bit, they have developed a cyber strategy and a community policing strategy. And these strategies seem to be shaping how they're now moving forward, um, looking into in particular next to create a data center um, as they're developing these linkages between the national offices, the regional police chiefs cooperation organizations, and Afropol itself. We also heard about regional initiatives, things like the Great Lakes Judicial Cooperation Network and other related networks in Central and Eastern Africa that are connecting prosecutors and directors of police in order to facilitate better investigations and communications related to transnational organized crime that's happening across borders. Uh, as we heard our speakers talk about, those networks can be useful for facilitating formal cooperation through mutual legal assistance and extradition, but they're also useful for informal communications, for unclassified information sharing between colleagues in neighboring countries, and all of that can also speed up um, reactions that different states have collectively to transnational organized crime. Similarly, it seems that there are some significant regional mechanisms like the Kinshasa Convention on Small Arms and Light Weapons um, to deal with um, this kind of trafficking. But challenges remain in relation to various countries that are part of that convention, domesticating the, the, the convention itself and harmonizing laws to fit the plan that that, that, that um, convention sets out, the framework for action that's set out by the convention. But challenges um, to complete ratification across the region remain um, an issue. On the EGAD side, in the Horn of Africa, there is a whole pillar of the security sector program that we heard about last week that is devoted to transnational organized crime. And uh, the program is taking a multi-agency approach that's connecting security and justice and other entities to develop technical training and capacity for countering crime amongst these different stakeholders. There are a variety of initiatives we heard about last week, but um, one that stood out is that there's ongoing work to share criminal intelligence across borders and to optimize the building of a regional platform for this, even sometimes in the face of the tense relations between certain member states that we see in the region and on the issue of undemarcated borders that was mentioned last week. A really key point that came out of uh, these various discussions is that there are multiple overlapping regional economic community memberships 
and different types of initiatives in the spheres of security and justice that are prioritized in each of these regional economic communities. So there's both a challenge in coordinating and linking up these different initiatives across the different RECs, but there is also seemingly a lot of promise given the variety of regional organizations that are paying attention to transnational organized crime issues in one way or another, in one market or another, and in relation to one particular kind of actor or another. But overall, it's important for actions to continue to be taken to move from fragmented regional approaches to those that are more comprehensively coordinated within and across the RECs. On the interregional level, therefore, it's important to pay attention to what's going on there as well. And there seem to have been some promising developments that could be built upon further that we heard about last week. There are some interesting examples as well to emulate from the maritime domain. In Dr. Mubiala's talk last week, he talked about um, briefly um, how ECAS and ECOWAS, the Economic Community of Central African States and the Community of West African States, have worked with the Gulf of Guinea Commission to set up an interregional coordination center uh, for coordination against um, different kinds of uh, security challenges, including crime in the maritime domain. And this interregional coordination center makes a presentation annually at the meeting of the heads of institutions for ECOWAS, ECAS, and the Gulf of Guinea Commission. ECOWAS and ECAS also have a bilateral cooperation um, accord and plan of action against trafficking in persons. They have a common declaration on peace, security, stability, and the fight against terrorism. And they're working on a criminal police agreement as we speak. Similarly, nearby, um, Central African and East African Police Chiefs Cooperation Organizations have come closer together to coordinate on exchanging information and data, to work more closely in handing over um, suspects to each other, uh, people who are suspected of transnational organized crime, and aiding each other in cross-border investigations. I think Martin Awe uh, mentioned, alluded to that um, early on in the program. So there are quite a few examples of interesting uh, interregional efforts to coordinate across the RECs and much more to be built upon there, I think, in, in various domains where we see other forms of coordination getting off the ground. A key thing to remember is that a variety of what we've discussed in this and earlier sessions relates back to those 12 resilience factors on the ENACT Organized Crime Index. So much of what the speakers brought up last week relates to law enforcement capacity and judicial capacity, which are two factors on that index. Uh, what we discussed last week also relates to national policies and laws, um, to border security and territorial integrity, and a variety of other factors that show up on the resilience part of the ENACT index. Even victim and witness support, the resilience factor that's weakest across Africa as a whole right now could be improved through further enhancement of some of these cross-border coordination mechanisms and initiatives that we heard about last week and in the previous weeks. Uh, now today, in terms of resilience factors, we're turning to a completely different one, um, the role of non-state actors and in particular civil society um, and citizens and communities in addressing um, and fashioning responses to organized crime. So with that, our objectives this week on the panel are to consider the security development and governance dimensions that shape how transnational organized crime affects citizens, um, whether uh, men and boys or women and girls um, across um, youth, the lines of youth um, and other, other um, identity-based um, uh, cleavages. We want to analyze how community and citizen relationships with state security and justice officials can affect their trust in these actors and how that can shape the coordination of counter crime efforts on the local level. And we want to identify various community-based and people-centered coordination approaches to counter transnational organized crime. We're hoping to uh, provide some examples that allow us to compare security and justice coordination efforts in rural border communities and urban centers as well. I'm honored and pleased to welcome two very distinguished panelists who are with us today to join me in our plenary discussion of these issues. You have their extensive biographies on the program website, so I will just mention a few things about them before we get the conversation started. Dr. Martha Mutisi is the Senior Program Officer at the International Development Research Center at the Regional Office for Sub-Saharan Africa in Nairobi, in Nairobi, Kenya, excuse me. 
Her role is to support and undertake evidence-based research that helps citizens and public authorities address the sources of violent conflict, insecurity, fragility, and poor governance, while acknowledging the imperative for a gender transformative approach to these solutions. She previously worked for Accord as the manager of their interventions department, and she has also worked on critical issues in peace building, conflict, and development with entities like the University for Peace, the University of Zimbabwe's Center for Defense Studies, the Open Society Initiative of Southern Africa, and COMESA, the Common Market for East and Southern Africa, among others. So welcome, Martha. And Mr. Raouf Farah is a senior analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. He focuses on migration and illicit economies in North Africa and the Sahel, and has published extensively on a variety of topics related to that region, including human smuggling and trafficking, security and conflict, and transnational organized crime in general. He has recently published um, Algeria's Migration Dilemma, Human Smuggling and Trafficking in Southern Algeria, and uh, After the Storm, Organized Crime Across the Sahel Sahara Following the Upheaval in Libya and Mali. He currently works on human trafficking dynamics inside Libya's detention centers and has been engaged with organizations such as the UNDP, the African Union, OECD, uh, Institute for Security Studies, and the World Bank. So welcome, Raouf and Martha. Um, we'll jump right into our panel discussion now, and I'll start with Martha, if you please. Um, Martha, in your work in Eastern Africa, what have you found to be some of the ways that citizens and their communities experience and think about the legitimacy or illegitimacy of transnational organized crime? And um, does that shape their perceptions of state efforts to counter crime? Um, we're hoping you can talk um, across gender and youth lines as warranted here as well. And um, we'll give you about seven minutes to start with that question. Sure. Great, thank you, Kat. Uh, and uh, thank you uh, to my co-panelists, uh, Ralph, and uh, thank you also to the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. So yes, I think my starting point uh, on the role of uh, civil society uh, and uh, uh, civilians and what they think about uh, transnational organized crime in the state's effort, the efforts to counter it. I think uh, the premise is to really uh, start from the perspective that combating transnational organized crime, at least from the perspective of uh, civil society organizations and civilians as well as communities, is something that is beyond uh, uh, um, the realm of the law enforcement uh, officials uh, and the criminal justice uh, systems. There is a thinking that uh, tackling something as complex as transnational organized crime is a complex endeavor, which uh, requires broad-based approaches. Uh, in as much as uh, crime impacts on security issues, a purely securitized approach to tackling uh, and countering transnational organized crime, uh, according to civil society organizations and uh, civilians, uh, is not the way to go, but the recognition that collaboration uh, uh, should be the way to go. Uh, most civil society organizations uh, and civilians are at the heart of uh, uh, the communities where transnational organized crime uh, takes place and where they are, actu they are actually seeing the impact every day. So the idea of them also being involved in co-curating solutions, but also co-curating preventive measures and strategies to prevent uh, transnational organized crime is something that appeals to them. Uh, I think uh, we, 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 in the past uh, few weeks, we've also been talking about uh, resilience promoting factors. So civil society organizations uh, being part of uh, the uh, repertoire of actors who engage with community actors to try and ad identify community felt needs and address some of the uh, drivers of crime are particularly uh, a, a, an important actor when it comes to uh, tackling and preventing transnational organized crime. But we are also seeing uh, a lot of uh, platforms and mechanisms that are emerging uh, as a result of the push uh, towards um, pluralistic uh, uh, security perspectives where civil society is asking for a voice uh, uh, on the table 
in order to address uh, this complex uh, phenomenon called transnational organized crime. We are seeing uh, uh, the emergence of uh, initiatives such as uh, community-based policing, some people call it uh, community policing, which recognizes the role of the community uh, and its leaders uh, and ordinary uh, civilians as equal partners in the prevention and reduction of crime. Uh, simply defined, community policing is a strategy that involves citizens in the design, as well as the implementation and evaluation of law in enforcement programs. So rather than the law enforcement uh, officials coming with an already a, a, a developed prototype on how to address transnational organized crime, it's always more beneficial to ensure that there is a contribution from the local actors who by virtue of being uh, affected by uh, the various types of crime, whether we're talking about drug trafficking, human trafficking, um, uh, uh, trafficking in wildlife, they have uh, intelligence, they have information that can actually be used towards uh, tackling such of some of these challenges. Um, beyond uh, community policing, we also uh, uh, see the um, emergence of uh, such mechanisms such as uh, neighborhood watch committees, which uh, initially when they emerged, uh, it was a, a response to the gaps that were uh, left by the state in terms of uh, the ability of the state to be able to cover uh, the, the, the wide reach of uh, community actors. But increasingly, we are seeing uh, a collaboration between neighborhood watch commit committees and law enforcement uh, officials. Uh, some, to some extent, we also see uh, them actually being institutionalized as part of the uh, crime prevention uh, strategy. Uh, in communities like Malawi, for example, uh, in Zimbabwe as well, in Southern Africa, they have actually institutionalized uh, things like uh, crime consultative committees, which are made up of uh, multiple stakeholders, uh, uh, including community members, civil society actors, business sectors, security companies, government departments. All this uh, goes to show that uh, civilians and civil society organizations also want to be involved in tackling transnational organized crime, and they believe that they have something that they can actually uh, contribute, be it through contributing in, uh, information, contributing knowledge, but also giving a different perspective, uh, which is different from the security approach. They can also provide a variety of uh, uh, multiple sources of information. They can also contextualize uh, and interpret um, the, 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 the legal provisions uh, on tackling uh, transnational organized crime. And I think also, I think uh, one of the perspectives that keeps on emerging from the community, particularly from civil society organizations, is that crime has become borderless. And uh, civil society organizations have also become as agile as uh, the, the borderless nature of crimes. Increasingly, we are seeing uh, civil society organizations which work across the borders. So why not take advantage of civil society organizations, some of them which are locally based, but also some of them which are regionally based, so that there is a concerted and in a harmonized approach towards addressing uh, transnational organized crime, particularly uh, uh, when, 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 when such crimes uh, affect citizens from different countries, uh, network-based civil society organizations become a rich source uh, and a, a rich resource to address transnational organized crime. Uh, not only in tackling the symptoms of the crime, but also in actually uh, seeking to understand the causes and the systemic drivers of uh, transnational organized crime. I think they can be an effective partners, uh, civil society organizations can be an effective partners to law enforcement officials, to security actors, particularly in promoting resilience, uh, in also addressing issues uh, such as uh, 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 peace and security threats, which tend to be intertwined with uh, increased levels of criminality. So I think uh, that's what I can say in terms of uh, the perspectives of civil society organizations and civilians. Uh, they want to be involved. Young people want to be uh, uh, working in partnership with uh, police. They want to be uh, working in partnership with security actors. They want to be working in partnership with uh, justice actors, not just as recipients of crime prevention strategies, but as key 
co-curators of these strategies. Thank you so much, Dr. Martha. Um, well said about co-curation rather than um, people wanting to just be recipients of those strategies. Um, let me turn to Rauf and ask the same question. He has a different regional expertise than that of Martha, so we'll get some interesting comparative insights here. Um, so Rauf, through your research in Northern Africa, what have you found to be some of the ways that citizens and communities are experiencing and thinking about transnational organized crime and its legitimacy or illegitimacy? And um, I'll ask you, to spend about the same amount of time, seven minutes. Um, you know, how do these perceptions and experiences shape um, how people are thinking about state efforts to counter crime in the region of your expertise? Thank you, Catherine. Um, thanks for the African Center. I'm really happy to be to be with you today. Um, so yeah, just to go back a little bit, I think before we have to speak on the, um, the citizens and community ex experience and the, and the legitimacy of uh, transnational organized crime, I think an important aspect here is to recall um, what communities and states in North Africa and how do they define transnational organized crime. I think here it is, is an important um, point to make from the beginning. So in North Africa and in the Sahel in also, um, communities, citizens, but also states do not define transnational organized crime in the same way. Both actors recognize the complexity of the issues that organized crime brings, but they do not have exactly the same way of perceiving it. States, in, if I want to be general, uh, they tend to systematically criminalize all forms of illicit economies. I think in the case of North Africa and the Sahel, it's more accurate to speak about illicit economies rather than an abstract uh, transnational organized crime um, object, you know. So I think from here, the states in North Africa tend really to uh, subsume contraband, which is the majority of, 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 of the illicit economy that is uh, actually subsumed under an illicit economy in, to the state's view. Um, and and, and that's, that's, that's one of the issues. That's one of the issues. When, we, when, when you speak with community, when you speak with citizens, they recognize that uh, drug trafficking, that arms trafficking, that human trafficking rings are something that threatens the interests of, of communities, but they, they tend to differentiate uh, between commodities and markets, even though they never say it so explicitly. Uh, so, and, and they do that in, in very different ways. Uh, so for instance, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the gender or the young versus the, the, the elder perspective, which is a component that you would like to, 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 to develop. I think here, um, for instance, when it comes to the, to the drug trafficking market, um, I, I realized in my, in my research when I do field work that they do not perceive drug trafficking in the same way. So for instance, when you speak to the elders of the community, uh, they still consider this market as something immoral, that's something that goes beyond the interests of communities, while the, the, the youth uh, tend to have a more pragmatic approach when it comes to, to, to drug trafficking. And, and, and that also reflects in the way uh, the legitimacy of, of the commodity um, basically occur or, or, or shapes, you know? And when it comes to, 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 to the women, if I, if I, if I, if I may to speak, uh, women tend to be uh, victimized by North African states. They, they're constantly seen as the victims of, of organized crime networks. But in reality, uh, women are also taking part of, of some of the smuggling and trafficking chains in, in North Africa. And then they actually play an important role. Uh, when you look at, for instance, the, the human trafficking and human smuggling industry in, in Southern Libya, um, most communities who run, uh, most people who run this kind of business rely on women to provide food, to provide housing, uh, to clean spaces and, and things like that. 
So women are really taking part, whether it is, you know, as active actors or as victims, as you know, for instance, you know, thousands of Nigerian women are trafficked to, to, to North Africa. And they are part of this, you know, begging rings in, in Algiers, in Oran, uh, and also in, in Tunis. So <clears throat> what, what I think the, the key takeaway here is to say that all the actors consider that organized crime is, 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 uh, is a very complex object that needs to be stratified or uh, bro broke out into different categories, but they do not see uh, what uh, the, the illicit economies in, in, the, same, in the same way. Um, I think if you wanna you know, do a bit of the analytical thinking around it, I think we can, in North Africa, we can say that the illegitimacy or the legitimacy of any commodity depends on, on some factors. The first factor is, of course, the nature of the commodity itself. So the nature of the commodity targeted by the state. Some commodities are more uh, push more push further the interests of the communities, and and reaching this frontier might be problematic or might be seen as problematic. Uh, that that is, for instance, the case of of uh, hashish trafficking, of cannabis trafficking in northern Morocco. Um, the other factor could be the approach taken by the security forces to implement. Uh, or to counter uh, organized crime efforts. Um, and, and, and here, this factor really can change how communities see uh, the commodity itself or the market itself. So for instance, the, the, the human smuggling market was not at all uh, a market that was criminalized 10 years ago in, in, in the southern parts of, of the Maghreb. But because the state approach has, 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 has really changed, people do not see the legitimacy of, of this market in the same way. Um, so some actors tend to get, you know, pull out from, from, from that market and others, again, are more inclined to, to, to enter to it because they are more risk averse or because the, the the benefits, the economic benefits, the advantage out of it are, are, are important. Um, the, the last factor and the one that maybe encompasses all what we say is, is the effects on the livelihoods of communities. I think here it's, it's something that, 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 that the state really needs to take into consideration when determining what is legitimate versus an illegitimate action. Um, otherwise, it will just create more frustration, more unrest, more discontent among uh, the community. And that's precisely the opposite of what the states want to do when it comes to uh, countering organized crime. Thank you. Thank you, Raouf. Yes, thank you for walking us through um, very systematically, you know, some of the factors and um, conditions you might look at um, in these discussions of how states are responding, what is considered legitimate or illegitimate in terms of the commodity, and for that distinction about um, talking about illicit economies in relation to this big thing that we're talking about here, transnational organized crime. Um, all really good points. Let me push the conversation forward um, another inch or two then, and Go back to Martha here and ask, um, so given um, this introductory discussion, could you run us through some examples of inclusive and people-centered coordination approaches to addressing transnational organized crime, the particular approaches that citizens and state officials have worked on together in your regions of expertise? Um, so how much potential is there for state and civil society to coordinate on these kinds of projects? And um, to what extent does civil society instead need to consider, you know, uh, focusing on fulfilling a watchdog or an oversight role? Again, I'll give you about seven minutes to broach that topic with us. Sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, so in uh, East Africa and uh, Southern Africa, where I've uh, 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 done the bulk of my, my work and research, um, there are several initiatives uh, which one can consider as uh, inclusive 
and people-centered approaches uh, to uh, countering transnational organized crime. Although I should put a caveat to say that some of the initiatives actually started uh, as ways of uh, trying to promote uh, uh, decentralized and devolved governance. So for example, uh, in East Africa, in much of East Africa, uh, particularly in Tanzania, Kenya, Uganda, and a little bit of Rwanda, we have uh, these institutions uh, that are called Nyumba Kumi. So literally translated, uh, it's 10 households per cell uh, that were introduced in post-independent Eastern Africa as a way of devolving governance uh, and ensuring that uh, local authorities are at the center of managing um, uh, local issues rather than to wait for the metropole to manage those issues. So when they were designed, Nyumbakumi was not a strategy for crime prevention. However, the benefits uh, obtaining from Nyumbakumi as a source of information, as a way uh, uh, that the, the 10, 10 household uh, uh, structure leader would know about what is happening in the community. Security actors became interested. Law enforcement officials also became interested. Even justice actors became interested because it became a center, a, a, an institution or a mechanism that could actually be used for dispute resolution. It could be used for, um, uh, monitoring uh, what is happening in the community, particularly in East Africa, where the threat of uh, uh, violent extremism was happening. So what we are now seeing is a close collaboration between Nyumbakumi actors, Nyumbakumi leaders uh, and uh, uh, police, Nyumbakumi leaders and uh, members of uh, uh, the security sector, Nyumbakumi leaders as well uh, with members of the uh, justice sector, because they are actually recognizing that beyond devolving governance, these institutions can actually help to monitor uh, threats that can uh, come into the uh, community, including transnational organized crime. Um, other initiatives, which also started uh, as uh, some form of uh, employment generation, some form of entrepreneurship, are the Boda Boda Riders Associations. Again, Boda Boda Riders in East Africa, it's a very common mode of transport. It's uh, it, um, the use of uh, small motorbikes for transport. It emerged in East, Af East Africa as a result of the traffic congestion, where one would want to get to the any place as fast as possible, and they would use Boda Bodas. But what also uh, security actors, law enforcement officials realize that these border border associations, they are a very powerful resource in the community, not, a, not just a powerful socioeconomic force uh, in terms of generating employment and also cultivating resilience in society, but they can actually be sources of information, which is what uh, uh, police actors uh, law enforcement officials need when they are countering transnational organized crime. Nowadays in East Africa, you, we are beginning to see that even border borders, they are on, um, on apps, uh, meaning that you can actually call a border border using your phone the same way that you call your Uber, for example. So they know a lot about passengers, they know uh, about where they are dropping off passengers, and they can actually be used as a wealth of information from an investigation perspective, from an information gathering perspective, from a trend analysis perspective, from an early warning perspective. So you actually see the institutionalization of regular meetings between uh, law enforcement officials and border border associations, just to know what is happening in the community. And I think uh, for me, that is uh, not just uh, using them uh, for their intrinsic value, but also cultivating an approach of inclusivity, an approach of collaborative approaches. So even when border border associations approach members of parliament with key issues, they, are, uh, they automatically get an audience because they are a powerful resource in terms of uh, employment creation, they are a powerful resource in terms of also preventing crime and sharing uh, uh, information uh, that uh, uh, would be useful for security actors and law enforcement uh, officials. So those are some of the examples that I would uh, consider. Um, and then also um, uh, some of the inclusive mechanisms that uh, we are also beginning to see are 
mentioned them earlier. Uh, it's uh, this uh, mechanism is called crime uh, prevention committees. In some countries, they call them crime watch committees. They have become so multi-sectoral and multi-stakeholder uh, 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 in, in nature. So you find uh, even security companies uh, who were previously not part of these uh, forums are actually uh, giving uh, statistics, figures to law enforcement officials uh, uh, on you know, the number of uh, crimes that are happening within a, a certain locality. Uh, private sector organizations, particularly mobile companies are actually a, a very useful resource, especially of, in terms of borderless crimes or transnational crimes. They can track money, uh, how much money has been sent uh, from which country to what country and by who. And uh, uh, relationships be between these actors and law enforcement officials, justice actors, needs to be cultivated, needs to be maintained. And actually, there should be um, uh, mechanisms that allow them not just to meet regularly, but actually to go through joint capacity building uh, initiatives uh, together. And then also from my experience uh, 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 doing research in East and Southern Africa, I've also found that there's now more appetite for state institutions to involve civil society organizations, particularly in doing crime research, crime uh, trend analysis. I'll give an example of the, the Kenya National Crime Research Center, where um, if you look at the profile of the um, um, researchers uh, that are at the Kenya National Crime Research Center, they are not your typical security actors. They are anthropologists, they are uh, psychologists, they are people who, uh, they are economists. Because I think there's that recognition that crime is just a, a symptom symptom of underlying issues in society. It could be a symptom of poverty, it could be a symptom of unemployment, it could be a symptom of unmet needs uh, during socialization processes. So there is that acceptance uh, of uh, wanting to accept multiple pr perspectives in trying to explain crime. So that also strategies to deal with transnational organized crimes can be equally broad-based, equally uh, 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 far-reaching, rather than uh, just focusing on enhancing security, enhancing law enforcement. Sometimes also what is needed is to address socioeconomic needs. Sometimes what is needed is also to address the closing space, closing democratic space, uh, which makes uh, people tend to other uh, vices uh, for, for survival. Um, also from Eastern and Southern Africa, what we have also seen is a joint collaboration between civil society actors uh, and uh, law enforcement officials and justice officials, particularly in training, uh, in one designing of the training curricula, uh, but also integrating issues that were previously neglected. Uh, during uh, training of law enforcement officials. For example, capacity building in uh, integrating a human rights approach, um, a human rights compliant approach to policing, a human rights approach compliant uh, approach to uh, evidence gathering, for example. Uh, 10 years ago, maybe this, this was not as common. Even integrating gender issues, gender uh, uh, equality, gender responsiveness issues in policing and in law enforcement, I think uh, much of uh, the effort has been as a result of the activism of civil society, but beyond activism, also collaborative efforts. Most civil society organizations are, can be credited actually for the efforts to create gender desks uh, in police stations across East Africa, across Southern Africa. Uh, that realization that uh, there are crimes that really cannot be reported in an open police uh, station, uh, they need confidentiality, they need privacy, and you actually, uh, right now in Kenya, there's actually a move towards uh, ensuring that those who handle SGBV crimes, uh, law enforcement officials who handle SGBV crimes, uh, there is a proposal for them not to wear police uniform because one of the arguments uh, from civil society was that the uniform can be a threat uh, to, to someone who wants to come and report. So uh, the police are actually making a motion uh, and I think it has been presented that uh, gender desk officers should actually you know, be in civilian clothes. 
We are now also seeing the piloting of uh, child protection centers in police stations with playgrounds that allow people uh, with children uh, or children who have been violated to come and report, but also to feel safe uh, so that they can be able to report uh, those types of uh, sensitive crimes. But uh, before I forget, I should also underline the role of traditional leaders and traditional authorities. I think it's one of the most forgotten uh, or understated um, uh, mechanism that is critical in countering transnational organized crime by virtue of them being custodians of our values, but also being at the center of uh, at the theater of uh, where the crime is happening. So uh, in, in some countries, we are also beginning to see the institutionalization of collaboration between law and enforcement officials with uh, traditional and customary leaders. Uh, for example, when we're looking at crimes that are related to um, uh, livestock uh, theft, the role of pastoralist networks is very important. The role of interreligious councils also is very important. Uh, if you look at the Karamoja cluster, which uh, uh, in, in borders countries like Kenya and Uganda, you would actually uh, appreciate that some of the uh, cattle wrestling crosses borders. So obviously engaging with uh, pastoralist, uh, pastoralist leaders networks across each country would be very important and, and would result in some maximum benefits for law enforcement officials. Um, yeah, um, I think I'll stop here uh, and maybe have uh, some follow up later. Yes, I'm, cer I'm certain there will be follow up on a lot of those examples later. Thank you for um, throwing those out there and um, going into some depth on, on some of these different aspects um, of, this, of this topic. Um, there are a variety of different kinds of inclusive and people centered approaches, as you can see from what Martha has just laid out. Let me turn back to Rauf on this subject and ask you um, to spend maybe seven minutes talking about um, what you think about roles that local civil society, community leaders, and citizens can play in relation to African security and justice actors in developing strategic responses for preventing or countering organized crime. Um, I'm sure you have many insights from your research uh, in North Africa that you could share with us. Thank you, Catherine. Um, yeah, so absolutely. I think I, I agree with uh, my colleague has just said. I think, you know, CSOs, um, so civil society organization, have really a major role to play, both in uh, preventing and explaining and deciphering and acting against uh, transnational or organized crime, but also in providing support to um, African security and justice actors in general. Uh, how, do can, how can they do so? I think examples are, are, are really numerous. Uh, in North Africa, we've seen that civil society and community uh, are part of the civilian chain that is fighting against uh, organized crime. And they are acting in changing attitudes, in changing habits, in, in providing alternative solutions, whether it is for the actors uh, of these networks or the victims of, uh, of trafficking. The, um, I think one of the specificities of, uh, of North Africa is that there is a huge lack of trust between civil society actors in general and the state, especially when it comes to security forces or law enforcement in general. Um, there are some you know, counter examples uh, that I, 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 I will highlight in a few, uh, but I think this is really a key concern uh, for, for me as, as, a, as a researcher. I think here the, 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 there is really a gap between uh, the state and the, the, the civil society actors. And that gap draws from uh, an evident lack of trust. Um, from, from the civil society side, people think usually that their action will be instrumentalized, that it will, be, it will serve uh, interests that, that goes beyond the interest of the community, or simply that they are threatened uh, or uh, surveilled by, by the state. Uh, on the on the state on the on the state side, 
often there is no channels of communication. There is no direct channels of communication with NGOs uh, countering organized crime in general, whether it is on, on human smuggling, on, 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 on human trafficking, on drug trafficking, or on arms trafficking, or wildlife. So uh, it is, uh, in, in most of the cases, the responsibility of the CSOs to find the right channels in order to approach the state. If they want to share information, if they want to share knowledge, if they want to share uh, any way of collaboration. So I think one of the biggest issues here is this, again, gap between the state and this lack of trust. At the same time, I think we, uh, we, we cannot uh, think about organized crime beyond the political nature of the regimes uh, governing the region. So in, in many countries, uh, there is a, an authoritative, an authoritarian pattern that we see even in Tunisia, which is for a while was considered as the, the only democratic exception in, in Northern Africa. We see that the space, uh, that the political space allowed uh, for communities and CSOs to act is increasingly shrinking. Um, and, and this is also a big concern. So the concern is not just to find the right instrument, the right techniques and the right tools to do that, but it's also to create the right political environment in which CSOs can operate. But despite that, uh, there's still some good uh, examples of, of NGOs and, um, and initiatives uh, that are led by, from the ground by communities uh, and that continues to fight uh, or to counter organized crime and criminal governance in, in general terms. So in my recent experiences, I've been uh, working on uh, a community, uh, the community of Zawara. So Zawara is a, is a, is a coastal city, and is an Amazigh, so Berber, natives of North Africa city in, in, in in, in Libya, so about west, 100 kilometers west of Tripoli, the capital, and close to the Tunisian border. So Zawara has this very strategic um, geographic location, close to Tunisia, with an access to the sea, close to the capital. And for a while, um, Zawara has been really the, the main trafficking hub, the main human smuggling and trafficking hub in Libya, especially after the fall of the Gaddafi regime. And in 2015, uh, two major shipwrecks, uh, two boats capsized basically in, in, in Zawara's coast. And that really created a sort of shock for the community because the community's interest, again, was threatened by those of, of traffickers. And the city said, stop, enough is enough. We need to re react. So since then, uh, many actors of the civil society in Zawara, like the Atwilur movement, uh, religious leaders, Azraf movement, and others, mobilized and led amazing campaigns against traffickers. So they printed banners, they distributed flyers, they approached uh, religious leaders in mosques to do sort of fatwas on, 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 you know, on denouncing the criminal governance that threatens the identity of the city, the Amazigh identity of the city. They also uh, been approached by the municipality, which offers them an office, a space. So that's how the, um, they got close to, to, to the municipality and to the state. And um, so, so they had this incredible, um, they had this incredible, stand against, against the criminal governance of, of these trafficking networks uh, to, a, to an extent that they completely pushed most of these criminals in out of town, so in, in the nearby town of Sobrata. But since then, other political development occurred in, in, in Libya, such as the war, uh, the, the battle of Tripoli, the war in Tripoli, and that also undermined the activities of, of, the, of the community. But they were also victim of the non-recognition of their efforts by the community, by the international community. So I did an interview one of with one of the guys who led this the, uh, the this campaign against human trafficking and human smuggling in Zawara, which is one of the only one I know 
uh, from the Libyan context. And he told me that they went to Tunis, they, they tried to approach different embassies, different access, different organizations, but most of the doors remain sadly closed. Um, so here it, there is also a responsibility for us as a researcher, as people who work in international organizations and, and research center to basically shed light on, on these kind of initiatives and help them to not only build their own capacity, but also uh, listen the gap that separates them from, from the state. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you, Ro, for sharing um, such good details about um, Zuara and um, how civil society there uh, mounted those campaigns and then what needs remain um, and what challenges remain in terms of um, their reception and their um, ability to continue that kind of work under the conditions that exist now. Um, let me do one more round of questions with our panelists. Um, I'll turn back to Martha here now and ask you, um, how can state security and justice officials best build trust with citizens and communities in areas where they're trying to counter crime? Um, and what roles um, you know, can local civil society or community leaders, citizens, play. Um, you've already started talking about this, but it sounds like you may have further examples you could share in the seven minutes we're allocating for this question. Okay, thanks, Kat. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, just to build on uh, some of the um, points raised by Ralph, that um, one of the uh, perspectives emerging from civil society or from civilians is that countering crime if at all transnational organized crime would not be successful uh, without civil society involvement. Two, it would not be su successful if there's no attempt to address the underlying drivers of uh, crime. So even if you are, we are looking at human trafficking, we are looking at uh, drug trafficking, we are looking at smuggling of uh, uh, precious minerals, the drivers uh, the, 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 the low, resilience, uh, low resilience that we find in high crime areas. So one of the struggles that uh, law enforcement officials, border officials uh, face uh, is that the securitized approach, the responses to the crime is just a tip of the iceberg. But one of the drivers is that people are trying to eke out a living. At the border between South Africa and Zimbabwe, I think one of the challenges that we keep on having is that people do not have the sentiments from the people is that they uh, they don't seem to have an alternative an alternative uh, uh, to the way of life. So maybe that's why they choose the dangerous uh, uh, you, you try, you, route of uh, you know being trafficked across the Limpopo, for example. Um, smuggling goods without necessarily paying goods, uh, for example, smuggling drugs and things like that. So I think uh, an initiative that would succeed is to, for example, include associations of cross-border traders so that as law enforcement officials, as security experts and border uh, agencies, they can understand what are the unmet needs that can actually be um, uh, addressed not just by law enforcement officials, but by other government departments, uh, by other stakeholders. And I really like the idea that uh, now uh, people are buying into the idea of uh, ensuring that borders are safe, uh, borders um, are inclusive. Uh, the common market for East and so in Southern Africa actually realized that they were losing a lot of money and revenues uh, by not involving the women and the youth in their initiatives. So they created what they called the one-stop border centers because people were not using uh, the proper channels to declare uh, their goods and, uh, um, and countries were losing a lot of money. So they had to work with civil society actors. They had to work with uh, voluntary associations in order to understand where are the blockages and how can they be resolved? Sometimes the blockages might not be resolved by law enforcement officials, but they can be resolved through the Ministry of Trade and, 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 and uh, Economic Development, for example, the Ministry of Policy and Planning. So a multi-stakeholder approach 
uh, to try and understand what are the factors that are driving people towards a life of crime, a life of risk, for example, uh, is very, very important. And also, I think uh, even at that, uh, the need to avoid homogenizing all types of uh, crime and looking at, at them from a security perspective. I think Ralph already raised those issues. The, the, there, there are some um, uh, transnational organized crime where people will say, from their perspective, they are just trying to put food on the table for their for for, for their children. Uh, the trade in 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 cut uh, in sugar in charcoal in Somalia and the smuggling that takes place. I think that also speaks to underlying governance issues, the challenges of the weak state, the uh, the political economy that and the social contract that is not being delivered. So I think trying to you know uh, map out all those issues in a collaborative way, in a consultative manner, would be uh, a, a, a good step in the right direction, not just trying to address uh, the symptoms. And I think also the other sentiment that comes from civil society and civilians is that it seems like efforts to counter transnational organized crime tend to target, uh, in quotations, let me say in quotations, the small people, um, you know, your, your border jumpers, your illegal migrants, they are not the, the 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 real people who 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 make big decisions or who benefit socioeconomically from such enterprises. Some of the people who are actually benefiting from this, this and driving these practices are actually elites, uh, political elites. So I think that the, the, if if there's that sentiment that the disproportionate uh, focus is focusing on the small people, on the little people, uh, on the ordinary person on the ground without necessarily tackling the governance agenda. There's likely to be some uh, conflict and some lack of uh, collaboration. But uh, let me also speak uh, about some of the initiatives that have helped to uh, move uh, the envelope uh, forward. Um, I think the idea of involving civil society organizations in designing crime prevention approaches, but also in implementing uh, outreach programs uh, towards uh, raising awareness in the communities is something that uh, one can say that it's, it's working, uh, particularly in, in East and Southern Africa. Um, in, in South Africa, the South African uh, Police Service has been working with uh, civil society organizations like the Center for the Study of Violence and Reconciliation, for example, uh, in trying to address the socioeconomic drivers uh, of crime. Uh, the CSVR lo uh, launched what is called the Community Works Program. Uh, it actually piloted that Community Works Program or Public Work program. Now it's, it's changed uh, from a uh, public works program to CWP. Community works program is an economic initiative that targets communities at risk uh, in South Africa, in, in Johannesburg, and in also in big cities like uh, Cape Town, uh, where the beneficiaries are, you know, youth at risk, those who were formerly incarcerated through employment creation, through provision of entrepreneurship support, uh, through uh, provision of care, uh, for the sick and the elderly. In some uh, communities, the social welfare department tends uh, to be under overwhelmed, actually. So such initiatives, actually, when, uh, when that pilot worked out very well, the Department of Correctional Services became a key partner of the CSVR. Uh, the Department of Cooperative Governance in traditional affairs, COPTA in South Africa, also became a key partner to the extent that the community works program is now being rolled out in many cities across South Africa. But that started as a research initiative which was led by a civil society organization. And the uh, success story of uh, that pilot initiative led the government to say, oh, we could actually potentially embrace socioeconomic approaches to crime prevention and institutionalize that. And the good thing is that it has led to collaborations between the, the police, the law enforcement officials, the correctional services officials, Department of Public Works, Department of Cooperative Governance. So it has led to multi-agents collaboration at the end of the day. Uh, beyond multi-agents collaboration, they are also now working with uh, 
uh, community-based organization to try and reach out to the youth, to the women uh, in the neighborhood associations, among others. Then uh, another initiative that uh, is also working is um, involving uh, civil society organizations, particularly research organizations or research institutes, in doing, in, in assisting or supporting law enforcement officials in doing trend analysis uh, for crimes, and also trying to also provide feedback in terms of what is the community's perception towards the law enforcement officials. Because I think scorecards uh, on how the law enforcement officials are performing is one way of uh, uh, doing performance appraisal and giving them uh, feedback on what they need to do to improve and how they can actually uh, 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 bring in uh, the support of civil society organizations in, um, in, in, in addressing some of the challenges that they are facing. And then the third issue that I also wanted to talk about, uh, which is also often forgotten, is how civil society organizations and non-state actors particularly faith-based organizations and uh, uh, voluntary associations are working to do outreach with uh, those in prisons and those who have just been released from prisons. I can cite uh, many examples, but I'll talk about the Zimbabwe Association of, for Crime Prevention and Rehabilitation of the Offender. Uh, one area that they are doing is to really support law enforcement officials uh, uh, by uh, doing outreach uh, strengthening um, um, training and capacity building of those who are released from prison, giving them opportunities, providing them with counseling so that we avoid the idea of recidivism, but also to avoid uh, particularly young men uh, who are then uh, uh, instrumentalized and used as uh, vehicles of committing crime because of the levels of uh, desperation. So I think it's also important to recognize that there's also an opportunity to work with those in prison and those who are just released uh, from, from the prison as a strategy of tackling transnational organized crime in the long term, but also as a strategy of boosting the resilience of states, uh, particularly, especially in Africa, where more than 66% of the population uh, comprises of people who are aged 35 years and below. So there is really need to understand what are the youth needs uh, what are the challenges that they are facing uh, and how can um, uh, we identify those needs and respond to those needs, not just um, uh, from an instrumentalist perspective, but also from a perspective of really wanting to emphasize and underscore their agency. Um, youth are very good in, 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 in social media. They are very present uh, in social media. It's one area that law enforcement uh, and security sector actors can actually use as uh, an untapped resource uh, to do monitoring of uh, um, crimes. Social media is rich uh, with such information for, uh, for, for them to be able to uh, uh, utilize in crime prevention. Yeah, so I think I will, I will, I will also, yeah, the other area that um, is also working is uh, creating platforms for dialogue uh, between security actors, uh, law enforcement officials, and uh, civil society organizations. Um, and those pl pl platforms for dialogue not just ensure democratic control or civilian oversight on the security sector and the law enforcement officials, but also they, they build long-term trust at the end of the day, that trust that uh, Ralph was talking about, the lack of trust, uh, is one of the issues that undercuts uh, uh, proper crime prevention efforts. But when there's regular platforms for dialogue, we then promote accountability, we involve citizens and civilians in oversight bodies, in crime watch com committees. They feel that they are part of the solution, and then they also feel that they are being listened to. And lastly, let me also talk about using peace building strategies uh, to promote social cohesion, particularly to target uh, young people and uh, groups that are at risk, um, facilitating conflict resolution, reconciliation, because some of these crimes also have to do with uh, trauma, uh, have to do with uh, uh, negative experiences that uh, uh, these uh, young people would have faced in the, in the past. So working with uh, youth associations is very important as a strategy of ensuring that they do not fall prey to being recruited uh, into a life of crime. 
uh, and uh, most importantly, transforming from a securitized approach to a service-oriented approach, where most police uh, institutions, I'm happy to say that most police institutions in Eastern and Southern Africa are changing and rebranding themselves from calling themselves a police force to a police service. I think optics matter, and in this case, encountering transnational organized crime, they will uh, be uh, uh, very important in breaking the cycle of crime, but also in increasing trust among uh, the uh, state actors and non-state actors. Sure, sure. Well, thank you for such a rich set of examples um, uh, related to this. Um, I think, uh, let me finally turn to Rauf once again and ask you a similar question um, about what kinds of inclusive and people-centered coordination efforts to respond to crime, um, you know, that our African security and justice actors in the audience here might consider undertaking. And let me ask you about that in relation to border communities in particular, which have come up a couple of times in our discussion. Um, what challenges and successes are they likely, um, are, are these African security and justice actors likely to face when they're trying to do this, particularly in a border community context? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, one of the most important cases when it comes to any efforts, any state efforts against transnational organized crime is, is, the, the, is to weight basically the interests uh, uh, and, and the scope of the action taken by the state and its impact on communities. In other words, cutting any forms of trafficking um, means assuming that there are losers and winners. And in, in, in that battle, um, North African states have usually privileged unilateral responses rather than well thought inclusive um, actions or yeah, programs uh, with, uh, with, with borderland communities. We just, we've just seen that last year in southern Algeria, <clears throat> when um, a young a young transporter, because they consider themselves as as transporters and and not smugglers, <clears throat> uh, was 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 killed, um, and 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 that and and the killing of of that young man was the consequence of the fact that the southern part of of, of the village was surrounded by, uh, by a, a, a barbed wire uh, without any pre-consultations with, with the community. Um, and, and, and here, this is really a, a concrete example. The city has been, uh, the village has been, uh, you know, protesting for, for weeks, uh, but the state has taken a unilateral response and that led to uh, this, you know, tragic uh, event. Um, just to go back to your question, I think if we would like to make any progress uh, when it comes to countering the impact of transnational organized crime or criminal networks across the region and in Africa in general, I think we need at least two, two things that are very important. One is to, before developing any program, you need to have really this bottom-up approach and bottom-up thinking. So you start by defining what is the interest of the community? What is the interest of, of this borderland community? What are the flows moving by that region? What are the routes? And how the state can isolate criminal networks from the normal uh, citizens, or at least those who uh, practice uh, any form of or another of, 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 of contraband economy. I think in, in, in North Africa, what we've seen is that there is some institutional mechanisms that are in place, like for instance, the, the bilateral comedies uh, of, of borders between Algeria and Niger, between Algeria and Mali, but these borders, uh, these committees do not integrate the voice of communities, do not integrate the voice of CSOs, and they are heavily dominated by security, by the security apparatus. Um, even the justice have really a minor role to play in, 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 in such 
in such tools, in such instruments. So we need really to think about it from a bottom-up approach and not just have a seat uh, to, to see ourselves in the table and listen to what they say and then make your own way of doing things, you know? So this is one of the, I think, the most important recommendation. The second one, I would say, when it comes to, uh, to, to the justice and security is a profound reform of laws uh, that are directly and directly referring to organized crime or criminality in general. Um, in, in most North African countries, uh, organized crime is, is really th threatened in a very homogenous way. And there is no differentiation, again, between commodities, between actors. And rather than having this very criminalized approach, maybe some activities should be tra treated as administrative, um, yeah, as administratives, you know, not, 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 not as criminal. And <clears throat> I think here, this could, this could be really a good sign of, uh, the, of, of the intentions of the state to, to be more um, open to, to what uh, the society uh, and what CSOs are, are, are telling on this. The other, the other point that I would like to mention is the, the lack of cooperation between the, the justice systems across the region, across the Maghreb. Um, and, and that's because, uh, and that's one of the consequences of uh, the non-Maghreb, what we call the non-Maghreb, which is the, the, because the region has not been able to to, to act as, as, as one actor and to develop instruments uh, where uh, there is a lot of cooperation. I'm thinking here about you know, drug trafficking between Algeria and Morocco, arms trafficking between Tunisia and Algeria or between Libya and Tunisia. And so we see, we see co bilateral collaboration, but we don't see that much a sort of you know, regional um, cooperation instruments when it comes to justice and even the, the security with varying, of course, um, uh, uh, level of, of, uh, of, uh, of difference of, of, uh, yeah, of cooperation between, between the countries. So a profound reform of the, of the laws, um, but also uh, the, uh, the full inclusion of, of the civil society voices in thinking about the instrument of, of the security and justice. Security must be more human uh, in order to, uh, that communities' interests are again protected, but at the same time, the state interests and the national security of the country is, uh, is also protected. Um, and, and the last point, maybe if I have one minute, is about the importance of, of creating knowledge hub, knowledge hubs between um, between state actors, between multiple stakeholders. Um, uh, uh, these knowledge hubs could, for instance, uh, be designed as platforms that bring together people who are working on organized crime. Uh, it, it can be corruption, it can be uh, uh, drug trafficking, it can be white crime, uh, white crime, etc. There should be agendas. Uh, for research, for, for research hubs. And, and, and we don't see that much of, uh, of it in North Africa for various reasons. Again, in Libya, it's, the state is so fragmented that there is little room for that. In the case of uh, Algeria, the, 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 the domination of, of the security apparatus is, uh, makes these kind of research centers impossible. In, in Tunisia, there are forms of cooperation, but again, uh, the environment today is threatened. So before thinking about any regional approach that leads to uh, you know, positive change, um, we, we need to have an evidence, we need to have evidence-based um, responses to the questions that we want to answer. I think that's a great way to a great note on which to end our moderated discussion with the two panelists. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Martha Mutisi, Mr. Raouf Farah for being with us to have this exchange.